So I've titled this message today, Principles of Prayer, and specifically, Teach Us to Pray. So I've already told you that um, what we're doing on Wednesday nights, but over the last couple of years, um, we've lost a lot of our prayer warriors. You know, I remember coming into the church on Monday mornings and Paul Bybee and Diane would be in pastor's office and sometimes Dale and they'd be praying and they covered this church in prayer and they covered the pastors in prayer. And for those of you who don't know, Paul Bybee went home to be with the Lord and Diane moved to Florida to, <laughs> to retire. And then, and they, that was in the office, but then in the sanctuary, Gary would be in here praying. And sometimes Ed would show up and he'd pray with Gary. And for those of you who don't know, Gary went home to be with the Lord. So over the last little bit, we've lost some really stellar prayer warriors. And I can tell the difference. I don't know if you guys can, but I can tell the difference. I can feel it in, you know, I mean, just look at the congregation, what's happening. You can feel the absence of those prayers. And so I guess what I'm asking for here, I guess what I'm saying is, we need your prayers. We covet your prayers. Please keep the pastors in your prayer uh, in the church, in your prayers, because we need your prayers, right? So um, it has been said that the secret of all failure is our failure in secret prayer. Not just our failure to pray, but our failure in prayer. Did you know that you can pray amiss and not see your prayers answered? Did you know that? The Bible tells us in James 4, 2, and I'm going to read this out of the NIV. Uh, for those of you who don't like the NIV, you sure can follow along in your King James Version, but I find it easier to teach out of this. It says this in James 4, 2, that when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. An example of this is the parable of the publican. Do you remember... Do you remember that parable, if you want to read it, is in uh, Luke 18, 9 through 14. But um, the publican goes into the temple to pray. And as he's sitting in the temple trying to pray, there's a religious leader there. And he is pontificating on all of the wonderful things that he is. I'm talking about the Pharisee, not God. And he's saying, oh God, I just thank you I'm not like this guy. Right? Do you remember that story? He failed in his prayers. He failed in his prayers. And the person that he was comparing himself to said, you know what? He's right. I'm nothing, God, but your love for me. Right? So that is an example of a failure in prayer. He prayed long, and he prayed often, and he prayed hard, but he was a miserable failure. His prayers were never heard by God because neither he nor his prayers were ever right with God. In order for our prayers to be answered, they have to line up with both the heart of the Father and the Word of God, right? Because there's going to be some things that you're not going to be able to find a scripture for, but you know the heart of God. And if you know the heart of the Father, you'll know how to pray. Does that make sense? All right. <laughs> Oswald Smith said this, when we work, we work. When we pray, God works. Right? How many times do we try to do this everything on our own? I tell you what, I have come to the conclusion that I am a great person for needing things to be in order and structured and having everything really organized. And I put a lot of work into the things that I do. And then I go, why isn't this working the way I'm hoping that it works? And every time I do that, I feel like the Holy Spirit says, unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain. And I go, right, I'm trying to build. And I'm not supposed to be the builder. I'm supposed to be 
the hammer. Right? I'm just, I'm not supposed to be architecting it. You know, God is the architect. He's just saying, hang on and let's go for a ride and let's just work together. And so I have to remember that all the time because I'm really horrible about, you know, just focusing. So, and you know, if you know me, you know that I have to have everything meticulous before I come up here. So I've always said to the Lord, please don't, please don't tell me to throw away my notes. <laughs> please don't make me do that because it'll stress me out. But I come to the place where it's like, okay, God, you know what? It doesn't matter because it's all about you. So whatever you want to do, Father, I relinquish my control. That's hard for me. It's really hard for me to relinquish control. So pray for me for that because that's, <laughs> that's one of those things. So if we're going to understand the, this principle, we have to look at how Jesus taught his disciples to pray in the Gospels, right? He's the best teacher. Jesus taught both by example, with his actions, and with his words. And in the process, we learned that prayer is to be a vital part of the disciples' life. In fact, you know, I don't know how I know that prayer is supposed to be a vital part of your life. Because the word pray, praying or prayer, is recorded 331 times in the New American Standard Bible, 545 times in the King James Bible, and 375 times in the NIV. And the reason there's a little difference is because different translations translate different Greek words differently. For example, uh, it may say pray in the King James, and the NIV may say ask. You understand? It's not that they're wrong. It's just that there are... And you're going to find this out Wednesday night, six Greek words for pray, okay? <laughs> that we translate one word <laughs> or so. It's that they try to find the one that fits them best. Okay, so that's what this teaching is about, and that's what is coming up, is learning and understanding prayer and how to do it correctly. Um, our key verse today comes from the Gospel of Luke 11, chapter 1. And we're going to see that this unnamed disciple, this guy who maybe wasn't even one of the 12, I don't know, because his name isn't mentioned. We don't know. But the Bible says this, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. I love the Passion Translation, so I've got to put it up for you in the Passion Translation. This is what it says. One day as Jesus was in prayer, one of his disciples came over to him as he finished and said, would you teach us a model prayer that we can pray just like John did for his disciples? So then I asked this question. What did he see about Jesus' prayer that was different from all the other prayers offered by the other religious leaders of his day? What, was it, what made it different? Why did he want to know how to pray? In other words, what motivated him to make this request of Jesus? We know from the verse that he was aware of John the Baptist. He was aware of his efforts to teach the disciples, his disciples how to pray. Maybe he was one of the disciples of John. We don't know. We don't know which one it was. So at any rate, Jesus' prayer stood out to him. What motivated him to, to ask, teach me to pray? Was it just for instruction? Or was it something deeper that motivated him to ask this question? And why was this request so important and so significant? One of the reasons that we can assume that this request was significant is because if you were to read through the Gospels, from Matthew all the way to John. If you were to read the entire Gospels, you will never find another request like this. This is the only one. They didn't say, Lord, teach us how to teach. They didn't say, Lord, teach us how to witness. They didn't say, Lord, teach us how to do miracles. They didn't ask for any of that. They asked, Lord, teach us to pray. So wouldn't you say, would you agree with me then that there is some significance to this request? There's some significance to this motivation of this unnamed disciple to find out why we need to pray. Maybe it would help to understand the, this request if we look at the one to whom the request has been made. When Jesus became a human, even though he was God, he chose to live within the restrictions of mankind. For 30 years, he never employed any supernatural means to live a sinless life. 
He walked, he talked, he behaved like a normal human being. And he was sinless. Why did he do that? To show us it could be done. <laughs> to show us it could be done. Because he was tempted just like we are tempted, right? He walked within the restrictions of the human, as, as a human being. We know that he understood who his father was. And over those 30 years, even though he restricted himself to the limits of humanity, he still fellowshiped with his father. It's such a way that everything that he did and everything that he said was a direct result from his relationship with God. Right? John 5, 19 says, Very truly I tell you, the son can do what? He can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, whatever the father does, the son also does. Right? <laughs> Whatever the father does, the son does. Whatever the father does, the son does. Are we sons of the father? So whatever we do, we should be done with what the father does. Then he goes on to say this in John 14, 10. Don't you believe that I am in the father and that the father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing the, who's doing the work? You can participate. Who's doing the work? Jesus or the Father? Oh, so does this apply to us? If we're walking in this truth, who does the work? The Father does the work through us. We just have to be a vessel. He does the work. Is that what it says? I mean, here you have the very Son of God limiting himself to humanity and saying, it's not me. I may be the Son of God, but I am the Son of Man right now, and I am walking in my humanity, and because I'm walking in my humanity, it is the Father who is working through me. Hello, people, this ought to make you happy because you I can have that same thing. The Holy Spirit working through you to accomplish the work of the Father. It's not about us. <laughs> True? All right. Just saying. <laughs> so Jesus, even though he is God, is 100% reliant on the Father. He modeled this for us to show us that we could also have this kind of relationship with the Father if we humble ourselves, right? Because we got to put the pride down. Pride will keep you from doing this. You need to humble yourself and pray, right? If we put our needs on the back burner and submit to the Father's will, or, hey, seek first the kingdom, right? Is that what the Word says? The Father, through the Holy Spirit, does the work. That's good news. Not only, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. Jesus as a human is showing humanity that they can do the same works. And then he says this, greater works shall you do. Right? You know why you can do greater works? Because when Jesus was on the earth doing his work, he hadn't raised from the dead yet. He wasn't seated in that place yet. But when he rose from the dead, the Father exalted him to the highest place. So what it says, Philippians 2, right? He is exalted, the resurrected Christ is exalted to the highest place in the heavens. He is sitting in the very top place and he says, now ask anything. Now I am in the ultimate place of authority. Did you know that his name is greater than Yahweh right now? Because God exalted him to the highest place in heaven. Who's, is God in heaven? Then Jesus' name right now is greater than his father's name because God exalted him to that position. And then he says, ask me. Ask me anything. Do you know who I am? Anything. True? Sorry, I got my preach on. I'll tone it down. I get excited about this stuff. Because I'm going to tell you what. 
Thank you, John. Thank you, John. I got John's approval, so I'll just keep going. If I probably see me go all red in the face or something up here, but anyway. All right. So I hope I don't lose my voice. I'm yelling too much. <laughs> because of their close personal relationship, the Father and Jesus, Jesus knew the heart of the Father. And everything he did, everything he did was a result of the Father's heart. His desires, his compassion, everything was rooted in the heart of the Father. I can do nothing I haven't seen my Father do. I can say nothing that the Father isn't speaking through me. I can do nothing that the Father doesn't want done. Does God want you saved? Yeah. Set free? Oh, yeah. Filled with the Holy Spirit? Oh, yeah. Laying hands on people and seeing people healed? Yes. Raising people from the dead? Yes. Casting out demons? Oh, yeah. He wants people free. He wants people free. And you are the instruments to whom he says, let's go. There's a book out there called Fresh Fire. Fresh, fresh, fresh something, fresh fire. And in it, the guy, he's a, uh, forgive me, I wasn't planning on to say this. He has a church in New York. The guy that wrote this, uh, Jim, that's it. What is it? Yeah, 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 that's the guy. And he wrote this verse, I began to despair that I may miss a move of God. I began to realize that in myself I could miss it. And he realized I don't want to miss it. I want to be a part of it. I want to be used of God. I want to see things. And don't we want to see some things that happen like in Azusa Street? I mean, when not just a leg grew out an inch, but a guy came in with no arm, and they prayed for him, and they watched, literally watched the bone come out of the arm and start to extend, and watch muscles start to attach to it. They saw his complete arm grow out and saw the bone, the muscle tissue, and the skin come on his arm. Don't you want to see it? They had one lady there. They said, you know, there's this... We all know this. If you've been in any of our Holy Spirit teachings, you understand that there are gifts, plural, of healing. And so there are specialty gifts, right? Just like you would go to a foot doctor or you would go to a cancer doctor. You would go to these. There are people who will, who will literally move in one anointing specifically for a specific thing. And there was a lady in Azusa Street that God gave her the gift of, for teeth, for dentistry. And she would play with it. She would go in and she, people would come in with no teeth and she put her finger in there and go, this one, God, and the tooth would grow up. And she'd go, this one, God, and the tooth would grow up. This one, God. And she had a great time with it. She just kept going, this one and this one. She could have prayed for them all at once, but she was having a good time. She was like, God, this is awesome. Throw this one in, God, and this one. You can see that today. God's not dead. He isn't sleeping. He doesn't slumber. He's ready for the church to rise up. But how are you going to get that? Only when you know the heart of the Father. Because it's not about a person. It's not about a ministry. If he did it in Azusa Street and he's doing it in Africa, he'll do it anywhere. Just looking for vessels who are willing to step out and take a risk. Because sometimes it's a risk to step out. Right? It's a little scary sometimes. But I think the first thing, I got off my notes, so I'm getting back on. The first thing that this disciple recognized was the intimate relationship between Jesus and the Father. He went, oh, wow. Look how beautiful that is. Can I do that? If we want to have a successful Christian life, we have to have an intimate relationship with the Father. Only then can we learn and understand the Father's heart. Only then will we have as our motivation the love of God, the love for God, and the love of God for the people that we minister to. Right? You say, a few years ago now, and I know you probably already... I told this story before when it happened, but I was teaching on this principle, the love of God. And then whenever you teach on something, God gives you opportunity, right, Brian? Gives you an opportunity to, to live it. And so uh, one day um, I was in the church and we got a phone call. As we do so often, someone was in need. And um, 
they were homeless, basically, or having some issues. And a lot of times we just refer them to, if we can help, we help out a little bit. And sometimes we refer them to some organizations that have some things that they need. But these particular people had been in the hospital and uh, didn't have any money. Just got out of the hospital, were still recovering, they were sick. And they were sleeping outside. It was in September, it was really cold. And I'm sitting there, and this is, of course, I'm just telling you the story because of who God is, not because of me. Because I had nothing to do with this, only listen to the Father and try to be the love of God to the people in the community. And uh, so I said, okay, where are you at? Um, all right, I will come. I'll call the motel there in this particular little village, and we'll see what we can do. So I was able to get them a hotel room for a week. And... Um, I get there, and they're, I mean, they haven't showered. They've been homeless for a while. And, and I'm like, well, let's pray while we're waiting for, the, I'm like, well, let's pray while we're waiting for the room to get ready. And so I go like this, and they go like this, right? And so we're in this, like, football huddle. And you're just, like, head to head with these unbathed masses, you know? But it was okay, because it was like, yeah, that's how God would do that. He'd just love on these guys, you know, and just bless them and just love on them and you just opportunity comes just to be willing to say okay and it's like okay let's go get you some food and let's make sure that your needs are met and know this you don't have they'd say well we'll pay you back I don't like people tell me this we'll pay you back because I go number one I'm pretty sure you can't but number two, <laughs> but number two, I would do it anyway. And I say, you know what? You don't even have to do that. This is because the Father loves you. The Father sought you out. The Father loves you enough to say, hey, give me your heart and watch me do many things. Right, Doreen? God can do some stuff, huh? Doreen knows she was homeless not too long ago, and now she has a place to stay. All right, <clears throat> so this relationship with the Father was something that Old Testament saints wanted, right? Few Old Testament saints, few Old Testament saints ever had a relationship with God. And of them, only one asked to see him face to face, right? And you know that story. He said, please let me see your face. God's like, no, if you see my face, you're going to die. He said, I don't care. I don't care. God, I just want to see you. I just want to see you. So God says, okay, go stand behind the rock, right? And I'll pass by, but don't look at my face. You only look at my back. Because the day you look on my face in your condition that you're in now, you will surely die. And you know what happened to him? He came down the mountain shining like a light bulb, right? He came down illuminating the presence of God. The same thing that happened with Jesus in the transfiguration. When Jesus was in the presence of God, remember, he shone. The Bible says he shone. Moses came down shining in the Shekinah glory. So much so, people are like, hey, dude, put a veil on. You're, oh, you hurt my eyes. Cover up, dude. What is going on with you? Um, Eric Gilmore told this story when we were at his School of the Presence. He told this story. I probably shared this with some of you, but he, um, he has this relationship with the Father since he was in high school. He went to the Brownsville Revivals. He got saved in Brownsville when he was in high school. And he came home and he said, God, I want I to duplicate the presence that I felt there in my home. And so as a high schooler, he built a prayer closet. And every day he'd come home from school and he'd go in that prayer closet and he would encounter God. He would encounter God. And so when his wife and kids are gone, he will like fast and pray for days. He goes, he gets up at six o'clock in the morning, he grabs a jug of water and he heads to his prayer closet and just spends time with the Father. He was on the end of one of these 10-day prayer and fasting events when he realized he was supposed to be at the jail. He was scheduled to minister at the prison. And he went, oh. So he gets in his car and he goes into the prison. The door's open and he steps inside, but he's still in the presence of God. So he just raises his hands and begins to go right back into the presence of God. And then he hears, Zink! and he goes, oh, my hour's up. And he looks down, there's 50 guys laying flat on the ground. 
And he just goes, oh. And he just walked out of the prison because his hour was up. He just walked out and the door closed behind him. And a week and a half later goes by and he's on the street because he's going to this mission to do something. And he sees this guy runs up to him and he goes, you're the kid. You're the one. Were you at the jail? And he's like, yeah. He goes, when you walked into the room, he said, and you raised your hands, you began to glow like nothing we have ever seen before. Your body radiated light. And that's why they all dove on the ground. Because the presence of God showed up in the room. This is not unusual. Smith Wigglesworth, remember Smith Wigglesworth was riding on a train one day. And some guy gets on the train and he just goes, boom, face plants it on the train, begins to repent. Smith didn't say a word. The presence of God was so strong on him. Charles Finney walks into a factory one day. Walked into a factory. Didn't say a word. People came running, falling on their face, repenting before God. Why? Because he was in the presence of God. He was so in the presence of God, he carried him everywhere. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. So this disciple... He sees this relationship between Jesus and God, and he says, you know what? That's really cool. I want that. Teach me to pray. Oh, so watch this. This, this part kind of makes me happy. Isaiah the prophet. There's a lot of revivalists who use this scripture. <laughs> oh, that you would rend the heavens. And come down that the mountains would tremble before you. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. And then he adds this caveat. But when we continue to sin against you, you were angry. And Isaiah says, how then can we be saved? How then can we be saved? Because when we do right, you're here. When we do good and we remember your ways, you bless us. You come down from the mountain to rest on the tabernacle. You came down from the mountain, Lord. And when you did, we saw miracles and we seen your beauty, Lord. But our sin keeps us separated from you. How can we be saved? He didn't know. He didn't know yet. Isaiah longed for this kind of fellowship, but understood that the power of sin separated him from the God that he loved. Today, because of Jesus, we can answer Isaiah's plea, right? We can say, you want to know how you can be saved? Through the one who rent the heavens and came down to the earth. He rent the heavens and came down to the earth and he bore our iniquities and sins and redeemed us with his own blood. Isaiah, your prayers have been answered. When? When was his prayers answered? When God opened the heavens and the Holy Spirit descended. Do you remember when he did that? I'll read it out of the Passion Translation. And as Jesus rose up out of the water, the heavenly realm opened up over him. The Lord rent the heavens. And he saw the Holy Spirit descend out of the heavens and rest upon him in the form of a dove. Then suddenly, the voice of the Father shouted from the sky, saying, This is the Son I love, and my greatest delight is in him. The heavens have been rent open. The disciple recognized his own longing to have the same type of relationship that Jesus had with God. Religion had left him empty. It had left a void in his heart. Right? He'd gone to synagogue probably all his life. He regularly offered the ritualistic prayers that they offered over their bread and over their food. And uh, he prayed the Shema. <laughs> Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. 
He prayed these prayers. He prayed the prayers, but they were ritual prayers. They weren't relationship prayers. So there was a void in his heart. He wanted more of God. He wanted the same relationship that Jesus had with God. He desired communion and fellowship with the Father. See, here's the thing. When you're born again, the Holy Spirit moves in us, right? Just like he did with Jesus. We now have the same capacity that Jesus had to have that intimate relationship with the Father. It's within you because there is nothing in heaven and hell that can separate the Holy Spirit from the God. They are one. The Father and the Holy Spirit are one. There's nothing that can, you can do to separate the Holy Spirit from his relationship with the Father. And if he's in you, it's already your capacity to have that same relationship already dwells within you. You have it inside of you. It's the same presence of the Holy Spirit that came on Jesus when he functioned as a man. Sorry, my lips are getting dry. I want to read this excerpt from Bill Johnson. If you don't know who Bill Johnson is, he, Johnson is, he is the founder of Bethel uh, Church in Redding, in Redding California. Um, some of the songs we sing here are from Bethel, but I want to read this to you because I thought this was so perfect. He says this, God rent or tore open the heavens, busting through the darkness of demonic oppression that had clouded the minds of the people and sent his spirit down among us and change the consciousness of a people. Do you remember when he did that? He said, I'm going to come and I'm going to change that heart of stone that you have. I'm going to replace that with a new heart, right? So God comes down. He changes our consciousness. Now we're conscious of him. Okay. Here's Jesus modeling the prayer of Isaiah. There was a violent rending of darkness that had hindered the minds of people for centuries. The Holy Spirit came upon and remained with Jesus. The Holy Spirit remains with us. And the Father in heaven is jealous. He's jealous for a fellowship with the Spirit that is in you. Right? That's why he created you in the first place. He wants a relationship. He wants communion with you. And do you remember that day? that he made Adam and he breathed into him his own spirit. He's jealous for that relationship, right? It's the beauty of that relationship. And he says this, there is nothing, no power of darkness, no demonic power that can stop the Holy Spirit and Father God. Right? It doesn't exist. Most closed heavens for the believers are right here between your two ears. Right here. Your thoughts, your actions, this is where we close off the Spirit of God, right? It's how we think. We become impressed with darkness. Not impressed in the sense that we admire it, but in the sense that it leaves an impact on our lives. It leaves an impression on us. We become fearful of the times we live in. We become fearful of certain obstacles that are there, uh, that there are to the gospel, certain obstacles that there are for generations to come into faith. And we see these accomplishments of darkness in something. Sometimes we cower, or sometimes we live with certain intimidations, and we pray in reaction to darkness. Jesus never prayed in reaction to darkness. He didn't care <laughs> what the devil was doing because he was about to break those works, right? His whole purpose, it? for this purpose was the Son of God manifest, that he would destroy the works of the enemy, right? He was not impressed by works of darkness. So instead of learning how to respond to the Father, if you live, to, if you live in reaction to the powers of darkness, then the devil has had a role in establishing your agenda, and he has actually influenced what you're going to do with your life. And he doesn't have that right. He does not have that right. He doesn't have the privilege to influence my agenda at all. He's not the boss of me. <laughs> Jesus didn't live in reaction to the darkness. He lived in response to the Father. And he told us, I can only do what the Father does, right? 
I can only say what I hear my father say. God is looking for a people who are not impressed with the powerful, uh, with, sorry, sorry, who are not impressed with the powers of darkness because the gospel coming out of your mouth is more powerful than any power of darkness. Knowing that there isn't any power that can stand against the power of the resurrected Christ that is in you. Jesus saw the heavens rent open over him, and I'm going to suggest to you, this is, this is Bill Johnson, he says, I'm going to suggest to you that every true believer has an open heaven over them. Because Jesus, it was already rent. The powers of darkness over you have already been ripped. They don't have a place anymore. Reinhard Bonnke used to tell this story. Maybe if you, do you know who Reinhard Bonnke was? He's gone, again, another saint that's going home to be with the Lord. But he loved to tell stories. And he, he told this story. He said, one day there was a man who, who um, was very wealthy. And he had this huge house and it had many, many rooms in it. And one night, or one day, he's in ho at home and he hears this knock on the door. And he goes to the door and he opens it up. And there's Jesus standing on his doorstep. And he's like, oh, Jesus, this, oh, come on in, come on in. And he, he invites Jesus into his house, and he says, oh, I want you just to live here, Jesus, and you know what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to give you the best room in the house. I'm going to give you the master bedroom for you to stay in. It is the best, it's got the best view. It's got the most comfortable bed. Everything anybody could ever want is in this mess. And I'm going to give it to you, Jesus. And Jesus says, okay. And so that night, Jesus retires to the master bedroom, and there's a knock on the door. And so the man, the owner, goes to the door, and he kind of peeks out, and there standing on his doorstep is the devil. And he's like, oh, but I don't want you to come in, but it's too late because the devil's already got his toe in the door. And pretty soon he's made his way into the house, and he torments this man all night long. And when the sun comes up, he leaves, and Jesus comes down the stairs. And the man goes, Jesus, where were you? Where were you? And Jesus said, I was in the room that you gave me. I was in the room you gave me to be in. This is where I was. And the man goes, oh. Okay, in that case, he says, I have ten rooms in this house. I will give you nine of them. Because there's one room I'd rather you not go in. I have some personal things in there, and I would rather you just don't go in that room, Jesus, but you can have all the other nine rooms in my house. So Jesus says, okay. And so that night comes, and there's a knock on the door. Boom, boom, boom. Guess who it is? It's the devil. And he again forces his way in, and he torments this man all night long. And in the morning, in the morning, Jesus comes in, and he says, Lord, I gave you nine rooms in my house. I gave you almost everything. And, this, and he has come back, and, he's, and Jesus says, but you haven't made me the owner of the house. Make me the owner of your house. And the man says, okay, I give you ownership of this house. So that night, when there's a knocking on the door, the man goes to open the door and Jesus goes, uh uh, this is my house. I'll answer the door. And so Jesus goes and he opens the door and there's the devil and he's surprised to see Jesus standing there. He looks at the house number. He looks back at Jesus. He's like, wait a minute, what's going on here? And you know what he does? He doesn't come in. He's not allowed to come in because the Lord is the master of that house. When we turn over our lives completely and totally to God, he becomes the master of our lives. And when the devil starts knocking, we say, Jesus, that one's for you. You get that door. I'll let you answer that one, right? Because when Jesus answers the door, the devil doesn't hang around. Amen. The Holy Spirit in us is in constant communication with God, and there is nothing on the earth above it or under it that can separate the Holy Spirit in you from God the Father because they are one. 
With that in mind, everything that you need for perfect fellowship with God has been freely given to you. He has ripped open the heavens just like he tore the veil in the temple. Do you remember how that was a violent rending? In fact, if you read that, you will see that not only did the veil rip with that violence, the whole earth shake, and it says that the stones that were around it split in half. That's a violent ripping. He ripped open that access. He's like, come in. No longer are you separated from me. Come in. And he did that when he ripped open the powers of darkness over you and saying, come into my presence. He wants an affectionate love affair with you. You are his bride and he's jealous for you. He doesn't want to share you. You belong to him. He's singing over you with this beautiful love song. I asked that, I said to my husband when we were driving into church one day, I said, don't you want to hear it? He goes, what are you talking about? I sometimes just ask these questions like randomly. I'm like, don't you want to hear it? He's like, what? The song. Do you want to hear that song that he's singing over you? Do you want to hear it? He's wooing you. He's courting you. You're his bride. He's wooing you with the song. He wants to kiss you with the kisses of his mouth. He wants a passionate love affair with you. So I ask you this question, how are you going to respond to his overture? How will you respond to him? Will you rise up from your slumber and run to him like the, remember the maiden in the Song of Solomon? She rose up and ran to her beloved. Will you run to him? Will you embrace him? Will you worship him? This is prayer in its purest form. Just you and him, loving on each other, unhindered and unashamed. I'll leave you with one more quote from Bill Johnson. He said this, people gather today around a sermon and there is some purpose there to understand the word of God but the Israelites, they camped around the presence. They camped around the presence of God. Yeah, we need the truth of the word, but you need to be camped in his presence. You need to abide in him. So we don't come here just to gather here to hear a sermon. We come here to abide in the presence of the Father. Amen.